Greetings, this is Greg. Discussing which World War II fighter plane was the best would be a bit tricky. With fighters, there are just so many performance parameters, time periods, and theaters of operation to consider, as well as individual variants of certain airplanes, think about the 109, that having a conversation about which one was the best introduces a huge quagmire of problems. I do want to have that discussion one day, just not right now. For certain types of airplanes, the debate about which one was the best is a bit easier. Of course, there's always some room for discussion, and in the end, which plane was the best is a matter of opinion. But with torpedo bombers, I think it's pretty easy to say that the best one of the war was the Grumman Avenger. Its list of abilities and accomplishments really puts it out in front of the other contenders. In this video, I'll give the reasons for my opinions, and we'll lightly go over the technical features and history of the airplane, but this is largely an opinion piece. Before we get into the Avenger, I want to mention a few other planes I thought about. These are just some of the other airplanes for which I suppose an argument could be made, but I don't feel quite equal the Avenger as a torpedo bomber. For example, the Douglas A-26 Invader could carry two torpedoes. It was fast, well-armored and had excellent defensive firepower, not just the number of guns, but the system that operated them. Not only could it carry two torpedoes, it had a torpedo director on board, so it was a legitimate torpedo bomber. If we just look at aircraft statistics, it appears to be far superior to the Avenger as a torpedo bomber. However, the A-26 could not be operated from an aircraft carrier as many naval engagements during World War II were decided by carrier aircraft, I think a proven ability to fly combat missions off of a carrier is essential for a plane to be considered as the best torpedo bomber of the war. So for that reason, I'm excluding not only the A-26, but any primarily land-based airplanes from this comparison. I'm also excluding any airplanes that never actually sank a ship or an enemy ship with torpedoes. The theoretical ability to do something and actually doing it are not always the same thing, especially when you're talking about warplanes. And I think if you're going to claim that an aircraft was the best at something, you should be able to show that it actually did it. I have some examples of a plane, uh, some planes in this later category, that is to say, planes that were possibly superior to the Avenger in a technical sense, but don't have the war record to back it up. In this category, we have the Vought XTBU-1 torpedo bomber. Vought was heavily committed to building Corsairs, that is to say they were busy. So this design got passed over to Consolidated Vaulty, and they built it as the TBY-2 Seawolf. The Seawolf has more power than the Avenger. It was faster, and by most accounts, was a pretty decent airplane. However, only 180 were built, and due to development issues, it wasn't ready for service until every torpedo squadron in the U.S. Navy was already equipped with Avengers. Thus, while this plane could be operated from a carrier and was certainly fast, it was never proven in combat as a torpedo bomber. Along similar lines, we have the Japanese B6N2, U.S. codenamed Jill, the Jill was a very capable airplane, but was never really able to shine. I hate to quote Wikipedia, but they really hit, hit the nail on the head with this statement. Quote, Due to its protracted development, a shortage of experienced pilots, and the United States Navy's achievement of air superiority by the time of its introduction, the B-6N was never able to fully demonstrate its combat potential. Unquote. That's exactly right. Torpedo bombers, for the most part, and especially naval torpedo bombers, have a very difficult time operating in areas of enemy air superiority. The Nakajima B6N2 Jill was the victim of really bad timing. The plane entered service in mid to late 1943, and had they, had they been a little earlier, then maybe we'd have more to talk about here. For the most part, these planes were just fodder for U.S. fighters and were also used as kamikazes. The British torpedo bombers of the Royal Navy run the full spectrum in terms of both combat success and performance and capability, and thus have to be mentioned here. The most famous and most successful was the Ferry Swordfish. 
I'm going to talk about this plane for a few minutes because while I don't think it was the best torpedo bomber of the war, historically it's very significant. The Swordfish entered service in mid-1936, but was completely obsolete about one year later because in 1937 the new all-metal monoplane torpedo bombers came on the scene. The Japanese B-5N Kate first flew in January of 1937 and was in combat in 1938. I think the Kate, like the Jill shown earlier, is a really nice looking airplane. Um, side note, now that I think about it, most planes from Nakajima look great. It's odd to me that their cars are not that way. By World War II torpedo bomber standards, the Swordfish was a poor airplane. It was slow, exposed the crew to weather, had very poor protection, had a poor service ceiling. It didn't do anything particularly well, yet as a combat airplane, as a torpedo bomber, it was hugely successful. During the time between the World Wars, there was quite a bit of debate about the possible effectiveness or lack thereof of aircraft attacking ships. Tests were conducted, which showed that aircraft could strike and sink unmanned, undefended, stationary target ships, some of which were older, obsolete battleships. Of course, sinking a stationary unmanned ship versus one that's fighting back are two very different things. A warship with a crew on board could shoot back, and damage control efforts by the ship's crew might greatly reduce the chances of it being sunk or knocked out of action, not to mention the ship's maneuvering is going to make it harder to hit. So the question was, could aircraft attack and do effective damage to a modern battleship defending itself with a crew on board? Well, it was the Swordfish, more than any other airplane, that answered that question. In July of 1940, flying off HMS Ark Royal, Swordfish conducted successful torpedo attacks on one of the most modern battleships in the world and scored very damaging hits, causing extensive damage to the bow. The ship receiving the damage was the French battleship Dunkirk. The Dunkirk had previously been out hunting for the German pocket battleship Graf Spee and had joined up with HMS Hood to search for other German warships, but now she was in a harbor in French-controlled Algeria when the winds of war changed. The French surrendered to Germany, and the British were concerned that the French Navy might start fighting for the Third Reich. The British attack on the French fleet is still a sensitive subject. There is some room for the debate about the justification or lack thereof for this attack. I'm leaving that for other channels. The point I'm concerned with here is that the attack showed that aircraft, and specifically carrier-launched torpedo bombers, could attack and cripple a modern, crude battleship. Of course, the Dunkirk wasn't free to maneuver. She wasn't at sea but some questions about the effectiveness of naval aircraft had been answered. The Swordfish then performed a similar attack on the Italian fleet at Toronto in a daring night attack. Again, the Swordfish showed the effectiveness of torpedo bombing, and three Italian battleships and a number of lesser vessels were disabled. In May of 1941, Swordfish scored hits on the German battleship Bismarck, which was maneuvering at sea. One of these famously jammed the ship's rudder, which led to her eventual demise at the hands of British battleships. In this action, no swordfish were shot down. Although some were hit, Military History Visualized has an entire video about this, and it's a very good video, you should watch it, but the short version is that the Bismarck, as with all other battleships in 1941, didn't really have nearly enough anti-aircraft capability. Of the weaponry she did have for this purpose, some of the guns couldn't depress enough to hit a close-in, low-flying aircraft. And it's said um, that other guns couldn't track slow-moving targets effectively. If that's true, the part about a gunnery, gunnery system unable to track slow-moving aircraft, then that represents a huge failure on the part of the Germans who put that system on the Bismarck because they had to know about the Swordfish and they had to know it was the plane most likely to be attacking the Bismarck. Plus, the Swordfish wasn't even that slow. The TVD Devastator flew at about the same speed when conducting torpedo runs. In any case, it's my view that these three events, the attack on the French fleet in Algeria, the raid on Toronto, and hitting the Bismarck at sea, proved the viability of the torpedo bomber, and it was the Swordfish that did that. 
The Swordfish also sunk a lot of Axis shipping, probably more than any other single type of aircraft, although that's a bit hard to quantify. They did this primarily by operating at night from Malta in the Mediterranean. This picture shows the USS Wasp delivering Swordfish to Malta. The Wasp, although a US carrier, was part of the British home fleet for a while. She was one of the worst U.S. carriers. There was some tonnage left over from treaties in effect at the time of her design, and they forced the Wasp's design to fit the remaining tonnage. A bit like trying to make a meal entirely out of leftovers. You can do it, and it's probably going to be okay, but it's not likely to win any five-star awards. The USS Wasp was an interesting ship. She eventually fell prey to a Japanese submarine. Actually, that was the fate of a lot of aircraft carriers in World War II. Anyway, those swordfish the Wasp delivered to Malta dealt a heavy blow to the Axis, sinking around 50,000 tons of shipping per month for a nine-month period. That's a lot. For all the success, though, that the swordfish had, I just don't consider it to be a great torpedo bomber by World War II standards. It was an obsolete airplane that succeeded due to superior British tactics, bravery of the crews, and to some extent, and I hate to say this, but the general ineffectiveness of the French and Italian defenses. As an example, the Italians at Toronto didn't even have effective torpedo nets in place. Neither did the French in Algeria, for that matter. Now, I know the Italians were busy doing this, that, or the other thing, and that's why they didn't have their torpedo nets up. Yeah, I don't care. They're at war. They should have been ready for that, and they weren't. Uh, so in that respect, the swordfish really caught a break. I have to look at it like this. The success of the Swordfish had little to do with the plane itself. Had the British been flying Japanese A5M Cates, I think they would have even been more successful overall. More importantly, I have to give considerable weight to the fact that when the British Pacific Fleet set off to take on the Japanese, they left the Swordfish behind. I think that was a good decision, and it clearly shows that not just my opinion, the Royal Navy knew that the Swordfish was not the best torpedo bomber of the war. So what torpedo bombers did the British take with the Pacific Fleet? Well, one type they took was the Ferry Barracuda. However, when operating in the high temperatures of the Pacific, the Barracuda's performance diminished to the point where it wasn't worth keeping around, and it saw minimal combat from British carriers operating in the Pacific. The British actively replaced Barracudas with Avengers. I think that by itself ends any discussion of which plane was better. It was probably an easy decision. The Avenger was better in nearly every way. The British used the Avenger to great effect in the Pacific. It performed well in battle for the Royal Navy, even scoring hits on one of the last remaining Japanese aircraft carriers in July of 1945. This video has gone on a pretty long time, and we haven't even talked about the Avenger itself yet, so let's move on and do that. The plane, meaning the Avenger, first flew August 1941, and in an incredible coincidence, Grumman showed the plane to the public on December 7th during a ceremony to open a new manufacturing uh, plant. Of course, that was the very day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, so it's a bit ironic that the new torpedo bomber named Avenger uh, was unveiled to the public on that day, and it was named Avenger before they knew about the Pearl Harbor attack. It, you would think that's not the case, but it is. The Avenger came out at exactly the right time. Timing is often what makes the difference between a great plane and an also-ran. For example, we usually think of the TBD Devastator as a failure. History has dealt it a bad card. It was a decent airplane, but my point is that it entered service in 1937. Had it been used in naval warfare in 1938, we would probably be talking about how the Devastator was one of the best planes of its time. But by 1942, it was obsolete, at least for the task of facing the Japanese Navy. The Avenger was dealt just the right card in this respect. It came out at the end of 1941 and was in service just as the U.S. really started to ramp up the Pacific War during 1942. And not only was this just the right time for a new U.S. warplane to come on the scene, but even more so for a torpedo bomber. In 1941, there were really only two reliable ways for an aircraft to hit and seriously damage a ship maneuvering at sea. These two methods were dive bombing and torpedo bombing. 
There were attempts at level bombing ships from altitude, but it rarely worked if attacking a ship maneuvering at sea. There are some cases of B-17s managing to do it, but it's the exception, not the rule. More often than not, they miss. The torpedo bomber only had a very small window in history where it could be effective. Prior to about 1935, carrier aircraft couldn't really carry and launch torpedoes effectively. They could kind of do it, but, but not very well. After 1945, there were no conflicts involving torpedo bombing, at least on any scale. In fact, I can't think of any case where that happened. And the very concept of torpedo bombing was soon made obsolete by new weaponry. That's not to say you couldn't do it outside of those years, but 1935 is about when all the needed technologies converged to make it practical. And after 1945, newer weapons were on the horizon. So the Avenger made its debut at exactly the right point in history. Of course, it takes more than fortuitous timing to make a plane great. It takes a great design, a good engine, and more. In regards to the engine, I really consider it to be just okay. I wouldn't say it was great. The Wright R2600 used in the Avenger was a 14-cylinder air-cooled engine, about 2,600 cubic inches of displacement. Its design is very similar to the BMW 801 used in some German FW190s, the air-cooled ones. I have an entire video about these types of engines. Uh, you might be interested in that. In any case, the R2600 had some development problems early on, most of which were resolved by the time the Avenger was really pressed into service. However, the 2600s still suffered from some issues well into 1943. These included high oil consumption and corrosion, which would accelerate wear. The Truman Report had some criticism of Curtis Wright, quite a bit of it actually, and it had a lot to do with these engines. Now, most of the problems were solved, and by the time the Avengers were going into combat in significant numbers, the Wright R2600 was at the very least a decent engine, but I don't consider it quite up to the level of, say, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 or the uh, Merlin or some others. In the Avenger, the R2600 was set up with a dual-speed, single-stage supercharger and an injection carburetor, which was basically a primitive form of fuel injection. The injection carb was fed air by a very good ram air system, but if operating in icy or dusty conditions, the control for carb, the carb air source, could be put into an alternate position to protect the engine but sacrificing a bit of power. In short, the engine was set up in a good but fairly simple configuration that was adequate for the Avenger's job. It didn't have a dual-stage supercharger, intercooler, or water injection, but hey, it's not a fighter plane. Performance for the Wright engine was pretty good. At military power, which had a five-minute limitation, they would put out 1,700 horsepower. There were a few variants that had 1,900, but normally Avengers had 1,700 horsepower engines, which is pretty decent for a non-intercooled um, radial. The plane was big, the biggest single-engine airplane of the war, and that R2600 could pull it to a top speed of 278 miles per hour. And it could do that with a torpedo on board because it carried the torpedo internally. The Navy wanted 300 miles per hour, but the Avenger just couldn't, couldn't do that. But 278, not bad. At its normal rated power, meaning a power setting with no time limit, it could cruise at over 240 miles per hour with a torpedo or equivalent internal payload, and was even faster than that at optimal altitudes. Let's take a look at a performance chart for the plane to get an idea of how fast it was. We'll open up the pilot's manual for the TVF-1. Note that the manual also covers the TVM. The TVF Avengers were built by Grumman, the TVMs by General Motors. In fact, that's an entire story on its own. But for now, just know that Grumman was really busy, so production of the Avengers was largely handled by General Motors, and the planes GM built are designated TBM. We'll flip to the loading schedule and find that an Avenger loaded for combat with a torpedo will weigh 15,002 pounds. Note that it refers to this as the wheel up weight. Below that number, you'll see the total weight wheels down. This is in reference to the landing gear position, which does not affect the weight. The plane doesn't get lighter or heavier as it extends or retracts the gear. But 
As with nearly all airplanes, gear retraction has some effect on the center of gravity, which is shown in the index numbers to the right. That's a very small change and of no real consequence, but in certain airplanes it has a bigger effect. It's not much of a factor in the Avenger because its main gear retracts outwards. Notice our weight for this chart is 14,500 pounds. So this is representative of a typical Avenger going into combat with a torpedo, assuming it took off at a normal combat mission weight, right around 15,000 pounds, then burned nominally 83 gallons of fuel. So this isn't a cherry-picked lightweight situation. It's where the plane would likely be going into battle, the weight at which it would be flying uh, at going into battle. At sea level and max continuous power, which is 2400 RPM, about 38 inches of manifold pressure, we can reach 215 knots of indicated airspeed. Note, manifold pressure is not shown on this chart. Now, flip over to our airspeed correction table and we find that our indicated airspeed is about two knots faster than reality. So, our calibrated airspeed will be 213 knots and this is at sea level on a standard day, so that's also our true airspeed. Convert it to miles per hour, 245 miles an hour, or 394 kilometers per hour of true airspeed at sea level. Sustainable, not with a five minute limitation, and with a torpedo on board. Under those conditions, 245 is pretty good. Take a look at 10,000 feet. We find the plane can indicate 193 knots, Correct for instrument error, convert to true, that's 220 knots, so 253 miles an hour, or 407 kph. Up at 18,000, and now we're on the high blower chart, meaning the supercharger in high speed. Now it can reach 226 knots, 260 miles an hour, or 418 kph. And again, these are all sustained numbers, it can, it can maintain these speeds. Sadly, we don't have performance charts for the plane at military power. Um, which it could run at for five minutes. At least I don't have those charts. But the maximum speed number I see quoted frequently for this airplane is 278 miles per hour. Considering that it can sustain 260 miles per hour continuously when loaded for battle, I think the 278 miles per hour number is reasonable at military power. Um, these charts are in the manuals, and all of the manuals from this video are in the Patreon section. So if you're a Patreon member, uh, there's a couple Avenger manuals in there, and uh, the manual for the Fairy Barracuda, and some other stuff related to this video. Moving on, it's worth noting that weight has a minimal effect on the maximum speed of the Avenger. Actually, in all airplanes, weight has a smaller effect on top speed than you might think. And viewers of this channel probably understand why that is, because at high speed, uh, the primary form of drag that's causing you problems is parasite drag, and that's not affected by weight. But this issue, weight not being really not really affecting speed, is especially true of the Avenger, largely because with its big internal bomb bay, it doesn't incur an increase in parasite drag from carrying a bomb or torpedo. There is a chart for this. Find the 14,500 pound column. Go to the far right, find 220 knots. Notice you, if, if you increase weight all the way up to 16,500 pounds, you only lose one knot of indicated airspeed. Dropping weight to 12,500 pounds, you only gain two knots. So weight has very little effect here. Now at lower speeds, at given power settings, weight will have a bigger effect on speed due to the larger amount of induced drag, which is largely affected by weight. So when calculating things like maximum endurance speeds or stall speeds, weight is a pretty big factor, but it's not much of a factor on maximum speed. And again, I, I cover this extensively in other videos that were done earlier on this channel. So in terms of speed, the Avenger was no fighter plane, but by torpedo plane standards, the Avenger was pretty fast, about 40 miles per hour faster than a Kate or a Barracuda, and about 130 miles per hour faster than a Swordfish. That's not to say there were no torpedo planes faster than the Avenger, there were. Let's talk about that for a moment. The Consolidated Sea Wolf, which I already mentioned, also carried its torpedo internally, and with the more powerful Pratt & Whitney R2800, was about 30 miles per hour faster than the Avenger. However, the plane was too late. The reasons for that are debatable, but in any case, never saw combat. We also have the Curtis Helldiver. It was more of a dive bomber, hence the name, but could carry a torpedo. 
The Helldiver was faster than the Avenger by quite a bit, but I can't find any performance charts for this airplane, and I'm not sure the Helldiver would be faster when loaded for a mission with a torpedo. I don't think it would have been. Also, the Helldiver would be slowed down with its rear gunner's hatch open for combat, not a problem in the Avenger. Even if the Helldiver was faster than the Avenger when loaded with a torpedo, which I doubt, but even if it was, it had a lot of other problems and was never successful as a torpedo bomber. The British flat out rejected the plane, and it wasn't really popular with U.S. Navy pilots either. Speaking of the British, they had some very late war torpedo planes that were extremely fast, like the Ferry Spearfish shown here. They also had the Blackburn Firebrand, very fast airplane. However, few were built and they never saw combat during the war. At least they never hit an enemy sh ship with a torpedo. The Japanese B-6N was certainly faster than the Avenger without a torpedo. However, there are some big holes in the available performance data for this plane. And I'm not sure how the speed of the two planes would compare if both were loaded with a torpedo. My feeling is that the Jill would maybe have a slight edge, but I'm really guessing there. Either way, the Jill never really had any impact on the war. As we talked about earlier, it was just too late. Then we have the Japanese B-7A, which was absolutely faster than an Avenger, with or without a torpedo. However, it was designed for larger aircraft carriers. Both The Japanese only had two aircraft carriers big enough for this airplane, both of which were sunk before the B-7As were ready for action. Thus, they never went into combat from a carrier. In fact, I don't think they ever conducted a torpedo attack on an enemy ship. I could be wrong about that, as records from the Japanese side of the war, uh, especially late war, are pretty spotty. Not to mention, Allied recognition of Japanese aircraft types was really poor. You know, for a while, every fighter plane was reported as being a zero, even though there were no zeros anywhere nearby. However, in regard to uh, this torpedo bomber, we know that only 114 of them were built, they showed up very late, and only operated from land bases. Had this plane had a chance to prove itself, it would be a real contender for best torpedo plane of the war. However, the reality puts it into the category of also rans. In short, the Avenger was pretty fast. Of all the carrier aircraft commonly used for torpedo attacks, the Avenger was the fastest one. There were a few torpedo planes that were faster, but in every case it was built, it was a plane that was built in very few numbers that had no effect on the war as a torpedo bomber. Of course, a carrier-based torpedo bomber has to be able to fly slowly as well. Just going fast isn't enough. It has to be able to fly slowly so that it can take off and land from a carrier. And in some cases, torpedoes or other weapons would have to be dropped from relatively low speeds. This wasn't a common issue with the Avenger, but it was famously the case with the TBD Devastator. It had to be below 100 knots before releasing its torpedo. Now, the Avenger's minimum speeds are surprisingly low. Here are the stall speeds from the manual. If it takes off at 14,500 pounds, the Avenger will lose about 2,000 pounds just from dropping its torpedo, probably burn around 900 pounds of fuel on its mission. Thus, we'll be down to around 11,500 pounds. Or if it takes off on a longer mission at a higher weight, by the time it returns, it will have burned fuel down to that point. So this would be a typical weight when it's uh, coming, coming back from a mission. At that point, the airspeed at which it will stall with power off is about 56 knots indicated at that point. Unfortunately, we don't know what the calibrated airspeed is at that speed, but we do know that the lowest published speed of 100 knots indicated um, at that speed, the Avenger's airspeed indicator is indicating 9 knots fast. And the trend shows an increasing error with decreasing speed. Thus, it's very likely that the Avenger's stall speed, in terms of calibrated airspeed, and that's what really counts here, at or near the landing weight was in the low 50s, possibly lower, which is remarkable for such a big airplane. To put that into perspective, we can look at a Spitfire Mark II, which has a famously low stall speed. The Mark II is an earlier lightweight Spitfire. They got heavier as time went on. And the Mark II has a stall speed with the flaps down of 62 knots indicated. And its airspeed indicator reads low at slow speed, so its actual true speed was higher. So the Avenger, even if you look at the Avenger at really high weights, 
the Avenger still has a stall speed that's at least equal or lower than an early model Spitfire. Now this isn't a perfect comparison because we lack information about the airspeed indicator errors at low speeds, but no matter what data we look at or what plane we compare it to, the Avenger's stall speed looks really impressive. Now there isn't any magic to this, or at least not much magic to it. The Avenger is a really big airplane, but it also has a really big wing to make up for it. Even at 14,500 pounds, its 490 square feet of wing area gives it a wing loading of 29.6 pounds per square foot. For comparison with equivalent payloads, meaning a torpedo and equivalent uh, time of fuel, the wing loading of a Helldiver or Barracuda is just over 32 pounds per square foot. A typical early Spitfire, before they got heavier, was around 27 pounds per square foot. So the Avengers, right in terms of wing loading, right between an early lightweight Spitfire and uh, a Helldiver or Barracuda. So the Avenger looks pretty good here. The Kate was amazingly good in this regard, typical of a Japanese airplane. The Kate's wing loading was 21 pounds per square foot, even when it was heavily loaded. It said that the Kate had a 43 knot, yes, 43 knot stall speed. Of course, it had a lot of sacrifices in terms of protection to keep the weight down, which contributed to the low wing loading and stall speed. I'm still impressed, though, by that low stall speed. On the subject of low wing loading, the Swordfish is the obvious king here. With its biplane design, it has about 24% more wing area than even the Avenger, and with its far lower weight, it has an incredibly low, by World War II standards, wing loading of 12.5 pounds per square foot. However, that's not as great as it seems. And I'm not going to get into the aerodynamics of biplanes here. Just know that biplanes usually don't have stall speeds as low as their wing loadings would indicate. And the Swordfish is no exception here. The only manual I have for this plane shows a stall speed between 48 and 52 knots indicated, but there's, again, no airspeed indicator error data for the airplane that I have. And in almost every case, British indicators read low. Thus, it seems the Swordfish had a stall speed only slightly lower than the Avenger, if lower at all, and quite a bit higher than the Kate. The Avengers also have excellent handling characteristics down near the stall speeds, partially due to the slots located in the leading edge of the wings forward of the ailerons. These are not slats. They're not things that move forward and open up like you'd see on a 109. Uh, they're slots. And these slots keep the ailerons working well at high angles of attack near the point of stalling. Now, why does this matter? Well, because the low speed and controllability of the Avenger allowed it to be operated off of very small carriers. Not only was the Avenger the largest U.S. Navy plane operated from a carrier in World War II, it operated from some of the very smallest aircraft carriers. The ability to operate from the smaller carriers was important because out of the 151 aircraft carriers built in the United States during the Second World War, 122 of them were escort carriers. When talking about U.S. Navy carriers in World War II, most people immediately think of the big carriers, the Enterprise, Yorktown, the later Essex classes, and so on. But the reality is that the vast majority of U.S. carriers were the much smaller escort carriers. Thus, a torpedo plane that couldn't operate from an escort carrier would have had very limited use to the Navy. By the way, did I mention that the U.S. built 151 aircraft carriers during the war? We sometimes forget the sheer scale of things in World War II. The Bauge class of U.S. carriers had an overall length of under 500 feet. It was one of the smallest carrier types of the war. Forty-five of them were built. Avengers operated from these. This picture shows an Avenger landing on the USS Card, a Bauge class aircraft carrier, or Bauge class, I suppose. Here's a picture of an Avenger tied down on an escort carrier, rolling in heavy seas. That wing folding system saved a lot of space, which was of obvious importance on any carrier, and especially an escort carrier. The Avenger's wing folding system was pretty special. Designed and patented by Leo Grumman himself, it did a great job of minimizing the space taken up by the airplane. That's a big part of the reason U.S. carriers were able to carry so many airplanes. Additionally, 
Like most U.S. Navy aircraft, Avengers were rugged and weatherproof enough to be stored on the deck, which contributed to the large complements of planes on U.S. Navy carriers. Let's look at some examples. This isn't a ship channel, so we're just going to blow through this, but we'll compare three big carriers all of the same vintage. The USS Enterprise, commissioned in 1938, HMS Ark Royal, commissioned in 1938, and from Japan, the Shokaku, commissioned in 1941. Ship specifications vary greatly from source to source, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but rather than get into a long discussion about it, I'm just going to put up the basic specs from Wikipedia. You can take them for what they're worth or look this up on your own and go to town. The Enterprise's displacement, in my opinion, is falsely low due to the U.S. trying to fit the ship into treaty limitations. But that's okay, because the exact specs don't matter for our purposes, which is why we don't need to have that discussion. The key takeaway here is that all three of these ships are about the same size, with the Shokaku being the largest of the three. In spite of this, the Enterprise carries the most aircraft. She carried a maximum of 96 and was typically loaded with 80 to 90. The Ark Royal had a maximum of 72, but in actual practice sailed with 50 to 60, quite a bit fewer. The Shokaku carried 72 aircraft and 12 spares. I haven't seen any official source or pictures showing how these 12 spares were stored, but my impression, which kind of means my guess in this case, is that the Shokaku stored those spare aircraft in a disassembled state so they could be tucked away and not use up... Um, the prime main hangar deck space. But no matter how you count them, the U.S. carriers usually carried more aircraft than their British or Japanese counterparts. A big part of the reason U.S. carriers could fit so many airplanes was because of the Grumman wing folding system, often called the stow wing. Stow is S-T-O. Avengers used this type of folding mechanism. So did some other aircraft, like the Wildcats in this picture aboard the USS Charger, which was another escort carrier. Speaking of escort carriers, if we compare escort carriers from the U.S. to Japanese carriers of similar size, in other words, Japanese escort carriers, again, the U.S. carried more aircraft in almost every case. The Casablanca-class ships, which were only 512 feet long, carried 27 aircraft. The Japanese Kayo was much larger, carried only 24. Even though the Japanese planes were smaller, because of their wing folding mechanisms, they took up more space than a typical Avenger or Hellcat. You can see that pretty clearly in this picture of a Japanese D-3A VAL, or VAL, dive bomber. The Japanese Kate was set up pretty much the same way. This picture, uh, this particular Kate, is in the surrender paint scheme, which was white with green crosses. It's pretty rare to see uh, pictures of Japanese planes in that paint scheme. The sad part of this picture, though, is knowing that this plane made it all the way to the end of the war, only to be scrapped. That's unfortunate, because today there are no complete Kates in existence, except maybe at the bottom of the ocean somewhere. This one is from the museum at Pearl Harbor, and it's about the best example of a Kate that we have. I've heard there's one in a museum in England. It's reported to be in similar condition to this one. Couldn't find any pictures of it. In addition to space savings, the Avenger's wing folding mechanism has an additional advantage over most of its contemporaries. It was hydraulically powered. This allowed the Avenger to taxi into takeoff position and unfold its wings at the same time, with no need for a ground crew to handle the unfolding. After landing, it could taxi and fold its wings at the same time, again with no ground crew. This was a big time saver for launch and recovery, and saving time is a big deal in carrier warfare. I should mention that British aircraft from Ferry had an unusual folding mechanism as well, partially due to the limited headroom on hangar decks of certain British carriers. The Barracuda's trailing edge portion of the wing, including the flaps, folds over on top of the forward portion. The whole thing then pivots back. The plane does have hydraulics to perform the first part of the process, but not the main part of pivoting the wings aft. So the Avenger was pretty fast, could also fly slowly enough to operate from the smallest carriers. Uh, the Avenger could also be catapult launched, and in some cases was catapult launched out of the hangar deck. In other words, they'd blast the thing out of the side of the aircraft carrier and it would fly away and uh, go off to attack. That's pretty impressive. Not only does the plane obviously need a very low stall speed to be able to do that, it has to be really rugged to uh, withstand that tremendous acceleration. Now, even though the Avenger was big, 
It didn't take up too much hangar deck space um, or main deck space and could launch and recover pretty quickly due to its hydraulically powered wing folding system. So all of these things are great. Now what about defensive firepower? I would say it's pretty good for a carrier-based torpedo bomber, but compared with a land-based bomber, not good at all. In terms of machine guns, the Avengers had either a 30 caliber gun mounted on the fuselage firing through the propeller, or later Avengers had two 50 cals, one in each wing. In both cases, the guns can be charged, which means cocked and made ready to fire from the cockpit. This seemed to be a thing for the U.S. Navy, as all their aircraft have guns that can be charged in flight by the crew. This is probably because there's a high risk to the ship and crew if the guns fire on a carrier, so they don't charge them until after takeoff. This is in contrast to the U.S. Army Air Force airplanes like the P-47 or P-51, which must have their guns charged on the ground, and if that gun uh, jams after takeoff, it can't be cleared until the plane lands. There was also a 30 caliber tunnel gun in most variants. This gun had a very limited field of fire below and behind the airplane. It was operated by the bombardier slash radio operator. I'll get to the crew positions later and you'll see why this makes sense. The Avengers main defense was a single 50 caliber gun mounted in a ball turret. At the time, most turrets in US aircraft, like the B-17's ball turret shown here, used hydraulic power to traverse the turret and elevate or depress the guns. These hydraulic turrets were usually manufactured by Sperry or Bendix, not the aircraft manufacturer. Now using hydraulics to power turrets made a lot of sense because most US airplanes had pretty extensive hydraulic systems already in place. The US designers seem to love hydraulics and they use these systems to power nearly everything. In fact, as a general rule, U.S. planes were big on hydraulic systems, the British generally preferred pneumatic systems, and Folke Wolf, at least in regards to the FW-190 series, were really big on electrically operated systems. Of course, that's a simplification. There was some crossover. The Wildcat used pneumatics for the flaps. The Barracuda uses quite a bit of hydraulics. But in a general sense, the U.S. aircraft favored hydraulics over pneumatics or electrical actuation of components. The Avenger was no exception. It used hydraulics for operating the landing gear, including the tailwheel, the bomb bay doors, the cowl flaps, the oil cooler flaps, wing folding and spreading, wing flaps, gun charging, and for the autopilot. You might think that with um, that hydraulic system there already in place, they would have used a hydraulically powered turret from Bendix or Sperry, like just about everybody else was doing. But they didn't. Grumman went another way and built the turret in-house. Furthermore, they did not use hydraulics to power the turret. It was electric. To make this work, they took a page from naval gun turret design for ships and used something called an amplodyne. And I have to say, when I first came across this word in the uh, pilot's flight manual, I didn't know what an amplodyne was. It turns out an amplodyne was a device which raised voltage above what could be had via conventional generators or batteries of the time, at least one small enough to be used in an airplane. The amplodyne is outside my scope of knowledge by some distance, so I won't get into how it works. You can look it up on your own, obviously, if you want. And it is slightly described in the uh, pilot manuals. It seems that they're no longer used in the modern world as they have been replaced by newer technologies. In any case, the Avengers turret with the Amplodyne system worked very well. It could move at 30 degrees per second in elevation and 45 degrees per second in the horizontal. That is really fast. Of course, it could also move slowly if desired uh, for aiming. The speed at which it moved was proportional to the gunner's input to the control, and with the Mark IX illuminated gun sight, the single 50 caliber gun could be quite accurate. In one case, a Royal Navy gunner in an Avenger turret shot down a V-1 buzz bomb at 700 yards. That's a really long way. He was awarded a medal for making that shot. It is quite impressive. The turret system incorporates cams and a micro switch to prevent the gunner from accidentally shooting his own airplane. This chart shows the areas to which the gun cannot fire. Um, interestingly, it does not prevent him from shooting off the radio antenna or the pitot tube. But those are the only parts of the plane the turret gunner can shoot off. On the plus side, the turret's fast. Accurate, has good safety provisions built in, and a really good field of fire. 
The downside is that the single 50 caliber gun in the turret, while better than a 50 caliber on a swivel type mount, you know, in the slipstream, and a lot better than nothing, really isn't a lot of firepower. The turret was small, so there wasn't room to use a 20 millimeter cannon or dual 50s and still have room for the gunner, the controls, the gun sight, the gun camera, the oxygen system, and all the other stuff that's in there. In short, no carrier-based torpedo bomber could reliably fend off fighters on its own, the Avenger included. However, the Avenger, with its guns covering most angles and its accurate and fast turret, had a better chance than most, certainly better than the Kate Swordfish or Barracuda. Now, I want to talk about the crew positions for a moment, as the Avenger is unusual in this regard. First, we have the pilot. Nothing unusual here. The cockpit is located conventionally, and the pilot enters and exits and bails out if needed through the canopy, as with, with most other naval aircraft used during the war. The pilot is well protected by standards of the day, with armor behind him and the engine in front of him. The pilot's compartment, aka the cockpit, is not accessible from any other part of the aircraft. Next, I want to talk about the gunner, who is seated, obviously, in the turret all the way at the aft portion of the canopy. The turret has considerable armor, so the gunner is also pretty well protected. Last, we have the bombardier, radio operator, slash radar operator, slash tunnel gunner. I'm just going to call him the bombardier. He is located below and behind the turret. Most naval torpedo bombers had three crewmen in a row, with the second crewman, usually either a bombardier or navigator, seated right behind the pilot. With its long canopy, the Avenger looks like it's set up that way, but in most cases, it isn't. Now, you may see some photos with a person in that middle cockpit, and that is what it's called, middle cockpit. Sometimes it's called second cockpit, but that's usually either a very early airplane, if you see a person in that middle cockpit, or a plane on the ground with someone climbing in and out using the mid-compartment canopy opening, or in some rare cases, it's one of the passenger versions of the airplane. There was a passenger version of the plane called the TBM-3R, which carried six passengers plus the pilot. Two passengers were seated side by side in the middle compartment, two side by side where the turret would normally be located. In this variant, the turret was replaced with a conventional canopy back there. And then there were two seats, one facing fore, one facing aft, so they were facing each other in the bombardier compartment. The 3R variant also had some sort of cargo pod which fit into the bomb bay. I've never been able to find a picture of that, but I know it existed. However, an Avenger used in combat in World War II would not normally have anyone in that middle compartment in flight. Much of that space is taken up by radio and autopilot equipment. Although the space is accessible to the bombardier and turret gunner in flight, they can climb up into there. At low altitudes, that wouldn't really be a problem but there's no provision in that compartment to connect an oxygen mask, and it doesn't look like the bombardier's flexible oxygen hose is long enough to reach that far once the plane was above 10,000 feet. It's unlikely any other crew members would go up there um, during flight, and they just don't have a reason to. Now, the bombardier's station is below and aft of the turret, and he also mans the tunnel gun. The crew members have very different... Uh, levels of protection. The pilot has the best deal here. He's well protected, can escape the plane with relative ease in either a bailout or ditching situation. The turret gunner has reasonable armor protection, but can't wear his parachute when he's in the turret. Thus, if he has to bail out, he will need to climb down out of the turret, which is not easy. Um, I think uh, Chris from Military Aviation History has a video of him climbing into that turret. Now, he's a bigger guy, but still, it shows you how difficult it is. Um, so you got to climb down out of the turret to bail out, which isn't easy, then don your parachute, then exit through the door. Now the entire door can be jettisoned to make bailing out a bit easier. There's a big red handle just forward of the door. You pull that, it removes the door hinge pins, then you push or probably kick the door and it's going to fly off the airplane. Plus, by the time the turret gunner gets out, uh, the bombardier is probably already long gone, so I don't think the turret gunner is going to have to push out the door. But in any case, it's tough for the turret gunner to bail out of an Avenger. Now, I don't think there are any statistics on Avenger turret gunner successful bailouts, but I'm sure the number is very low, especially considering that these planes often fought at low altitudes. And I've seen comments by people 
that flew Avengers during the war or were crewmen on Avengers saying that they didn't know of any uh, turret gunner that successfully bailed out of an Avengers. So I think it was very rare. Now, if the plane ditches, that's a much better deal for the turret gunner. The turret has a round hatch on the port side, which can be, so to the gunner's right when he's facing aft, which can be jettisoned, making exiting into the water pretty easy. Note that in this picture you can see uh, both the jettisoned turret hatch and the jettisoned entry door. The artist uh, thought this through. Now the bombardier probably has the worst deal here. First of all, he has no armor protection of his own. I suppose he's pretty well protected from fire from the front as there's just, a, he doesn't have specific armor for that, but there's just a lot of stuff between him and the front of the airplane. Uh, not to mention the engine and the armor for the pilot and the turret. However, from the rear side or below, he has essentially nothing. If he has to bail out, that's not too bad. He can just jettison the door and be on his way. If ditching, it's not great, but not terrible. He can crawl up to that middle compartment and there's a hatch in the canopy through which he can exit. Earlier, I mentioned that middle compartment containing autopilot controls. So that brings us to the autopilot. Yes, the Avenger has one, and I'm sure that the pilots appreciated it because while the Avenger had good flying qualities, and it also had three-axis trim, so you could trim it up pretty well, but the Avenger's controls were very heavy and required a lot of stick force to operate. The Navy actually tried to do something about this, and there's a NACA report about that. So having an autopilot was a real luxury and allowed the pilot to take some of his attention off flying the airplane for use in other tasks. Of course, I don't think that's why Grumman and the Navy put it in. They put it in there because they had to in order to allow the bombardier to steer the airplane on the bomb run. You see, the Avenger was built so that it could do level bombing or torpedo bombing and various other missions. It could lay smoke, fire rockets, all kinds of stuff. We're mostly focused on torpedo bombing uh, today in this video. So, for the Avenger's designers, the idea of having a modern bomb site and connected autopilot to allow the bombardier to aim and drop the bombs made a lot of sense when Grumman started the project. However, in actual practice, the bombardier was rarely the one who released the weapons. It was usually the pilot for a few reasons. First of all, the torpedoes could only be released by the pilot. The same was true of the smoke system, rockets, and of course the forward firing machine guns. Very often when bombing, Avengers, em Avengers employed a glide bombing technique. It's a lot like dive bombing, but done at a much more shallow angle. The Avenger cannot legitimately dive bomb, but it can glide bomb, and during glide bombing, the pilot would release the bombs. So the only time an Avenger bombardier would be likely to release a weapon was during level bombing. But when level bombing was done, it was often from an altitude too low to use the site in automation. So in those cases, the pilot usually released the bombs as well. So what did the bombardier do in this airplane? Well, first of all, let's remember he's a bombardier radio operator tail gunner. And when installed, he's also the radar operator. So even without bombardier specific duties, he still has some work cut out for him. Now, as a bombardier, he can open and close the bomb bay doors. So the pilot can do that as well. The bombardier can release the bombs if needed, and the bombardier controls the intervalometer, which is pretty important. This device is located on the left sidewall of the bombardier's compartment, and it sets the spacing of the bombs when dropped. In other words, if bombing troops in a jungle, the Avenger would likely be carrying 12 100-pound bombs. That's one of its many possible loadouts. Now, you, of course, don't want to drop all 12 bombs at once, you don't want to kill one person really, really dead. You want to spread the carnage out over some distance. The whole idea is to spread the damage out um, and destroy as many soft targets as possible. The intervalometer allows for that. I've never found instructions on how to use it or how it works, but we can surmise some things just from looking at it. It appears that the bombardier could set the bomb spacing in terms of feet thus could space the bombs out from 7 to 400 feet each. It's interesting to me that the setting is in terms of distance and not time. That means the intervalometer, the system, has to know aircraft speed. In fact, it has to know true aircraft airspeed, which it would have to calculate from, um, from indicated. So it's somewhat complex. 
Some Avengers were radar equipped and the Bombardier also served as the radar operator. In World War II, these radar units could detect enemy ships at a range of about 20 miles and I've heard it claimed that a good operator could actually tell the difference between an allied ship and a Japanese ship by what he saw on the screen. This radar system, plus the Avengers radio altimeter in the pilot's cockpit, allowed the crew to fly low over the ocean at night and or in low visibility conditions and effectively search for and attack enemy ships and surfaced submarines. Operation of the radios for communication was also the bombardier's responsibility and a pretty big deal. A lot of communication was done via Morse code and that had to be handled by the bombardier because it's a labor-intensive thing to send and receive Morse code messages. In fact, in an interview on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description, a former Avenger bombardier said that his training for this position in the U.S. Navy took about four months, maybe five months, and he specifically mentions that they were able to, uh, they were required to be able to send out 16 words a minute in Morse code. Of course, the bombardier also operated the tunnel gun, sometimes called the Stinger, so he had quite a bit of responsibility. However, in certain types of late war missions, he didn't have much responsibility at all. For example, if the plane wasn't going to encounter enemy fighters, wasn't radar equipped, and didn't need to use Morse code, and if it was going out armed with a torpedo, the bombardier wouldn't have much to do, but would be at great risk due to a lack of armor in the position. I've read some secondary sources that on some late war missions the Avengers sometimes flew with a two-man crew. Um, that kind of makes sense for some reason. I mean, why expose someone to danger um, if he's not needed on the mission? The only hesitation I have to agree to that is there are some electrical controls, including power to the turret, um, that are switched on or off from the bombardier's position, and it would be difficult for the turret gunner to get out and reset things and get back in. So I'm not really sure if they always flew missions with the three-man crew on Avengers in combat or not. Certainly not in combat, you know, they could do it. So speaking of combat, how did the Avenger do in combat? Well, it debuted at Midway, which didn't go well. There were only six of them there. Uh, the squadron had just got them. The pilots had just been trained on them. They were all based on the island of Midway. They were not operating off of a carrier. And they were the first, or among the very first, uh, Americans to attack the Japanese fleet at Midway. They did so without fighter cover, and they suffered the full wrath of the defending Japanese fighter pilot. No Avenger scored a torpedo hit. Five out of six were shot down, and the single plane that made it back was badly damaged with two wounded and one dead crew member. This wasn't a great start for the U.S. Navy's new torpedo plane, but in defense of the Avenger and crews, I'll say they were dealt a really bad hand. I don't think any six World War II Navy torpedo bombers of any type with any crew could have succeeded in that mission. They went in without fighter cover and tried to attack a carrier group with four aircraft carriers, not to mention a lot of, a lot of other ships putting up anti-aircraft fire. And... The defending fighters were all flown by, uh, they were all zeros with experienced pilots. Now the single surviving but heavily damaged Avenger was sent back to the United States for post-battle evaluation. I don't know exactly what happened in that evaluation, but considering that they continued to use Avengers, I think the Navy's conclusion was something like my own, that the lack of the plane's success at Midway was not due to shortcomings of the airplane itself. I also suspect that after Midway, at least some people must have been questioning the use of torpedo bombers in general, as opposed to dive bombers. In April of 1942, well, yeah, let's back up a little bit and go over a little bit of history so I can explain my viewpoint here. In April of 1942, the Japanese sank the British aircraft carrier Hermes. This isn't a battle that's discussed very often, but it did happen. And the Hermes was a very old aircraft carrier. But in any case, the Japanese attacked her and sank her exclusively with dive bombers. There were no torpedo bombers involved. The next month at the Battle of Coral Sea, which most of us have heard of, the Japanese carrier Shoho was hit and probably knocked out of action by U.S. Navy dive bombers. She was also hit by torpedoes from TBD Devastators, but the dive bombers hit her first and scored decisive blows. In fact, the dive bombers hit her 13 times, easily enough to sink her. In the same battle, U.S. dive bombers also hit the fleet carrier Shokaku, didn't sink her, but knocked her out of the fight and forced her to retreat. 
On the other hand, U.S. torpedo bombers failed to score any hits on Shokaku. In the same battle, Japanese dive bombers hit USS Yorktown, damaging her um, pretty extensively, but they didn't score any torpedo hits, and they did try. The USS Lexington took hits from both dive and torpedo bombing. Thus, up to this point in the Pacific War, dive bombers were proving to be much more effective against aircraft carriers than torpedo bombers. HMS Hermes was sunk exclusively by dive bombers. Yorktown and Chicago were both attacked by torpedo bombers at Coral Sea, yet neither took any torpedo hits. However, both were knocked out of the fight and forced to retreat by dive bombers. Shoho and Lexington were both hit by bombs and torpedoes, but in the case of the Shoho, the bombs were the first hits and were decisive. In other words, Shoho would have sunk whether she got hit by torpedoes or not. The USS Lexington did take serious damage from Japanese torpedo bombers, but she was also hit by dive bombers. Also, and this is a side note, but apparently the USS Lexington had an unusually large turn radius, making her easier to hit with torpedoes. But that's a whole other story and really one for another channel. Now, the very next month at Midway, well, what happened there? All four Japanese carriers were sunk by dive bombers. No carrier-launched U.S. torpedo plane scored a hit, um, and neither did the New Avengers, which, of course, were launched from Midway. The only plane, as a point of interest, and I have a video that covers this, but the only plane that scored a torpedo hit um, at Midway from the U.S. side, in other words, the only U.S. airplane to score a torpedo hit at Midway was a PBY Catalina, and it flew in at night, and it, and it didn't even sink anything. It hit an oiler or something. It did, a little bit, did some damage. Now, throughout the rest of the war, it was usually the dive bombers, not the torpedo bombers, that hit Japanese carriers. The U.S. Navy prioritized dive bombing enemy carriers because a bomb hitting the flight deck of a Japanese carrier, or a U.S. carrier for that matter, would very likely prevent it from launching or recovering aircraft until repairs could be completed. Thus, in a battle between aircraft carriers, dive bombing was more likely to be the deciding factor as compared with torpedo bombing. So why not just pack the carriers with dive bombers and forgo the torpedo bombers entirely? Well, there are actually at least two really good reasons not to do that and keep the torpedo bombers around. First of all, with regards to carrier-on-carrier -carrier combat, if only dive bombers are involved in an attack, that makes it easier for the enemy fighters to stop the attack and defend the fleet. In fact, it makes it much easier because the fighters can loiter up at relatively high altitude and attack the incoming dive bombers. But when torpedo bombers are present, or when there's a threat of torpedo bombers coming in, at least some of the fighters, some of the time, are going to have to be down low and will not be able to climb up fast enough to stop the attacking incoming dive bombers. And this is part of what happened at Midway. The Japanese fighters were caught down low when the U.S. dive bombers came in, and they couldn't defend the fleet. They were out of position down low because they had been dealing with the torpedo bombing threat. So even though no U.S. carrier plane scored a torpedo hit at Midway, they still contributed to the victory by bringing the Japanese fighters down to the deck. And although it wasn't part of the plan, it inadvertently cleared the way for the dive bombers. Uh, frankly, the U.S. got very lucky in Midway. Uh, yes, we had broken the Japanese code, and we had some good airplanes and good, car good carriers, and um, overall, pretty good organization. But there were a lot of things that happened uh, at Midway that were just very, very lucky for the U.S., and uh, thankfully it went that way. Of course, when talking about torpedo bombers, it's not all about attacking carriers. Naval aircraft had other duties. When attacking battleships or other big gun warships, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and so forth, the torpedo bomber has an advantage over the dive bomber, and it's one that's seen many times over and over during World War II. When the torpedo bomber is down low, it's very hard for anti-aircraft guns to target them. Don't get me wrong, they can still do it, and low-flying torpedo bombers were shot down. It was a dangerous job. Um, but shooting them down when they're, when they're low could be difficult for anti-aircraft fire. And I've heard accounts of Avenger pilots flying so low that water spray from the propeller would get into the bomb bay when they opened the gear doors. And they stayed that low specifically to try and stay under the anti-aircraft gun's field of fire. Now this tactic was especially effective once a battleship or heavy cruiser or whatever started to list. 
And this was a common tactic used by both the U.S. and the Japanese. Once a battleship starts to list, torpedo bombers can then attack from the opposite side with greatly reduced chances of it being shot down. The first modern battleship to be sunk by aircraft while maneuvering at sea was the HMS Prince of Wales. This was right after Pearl Harbor. She was sunk by Japanese twin-engine land-based, not carrier-based torpedo bombers, but land-based torpedo bombers. The Prince of Wales had a modern, for the time, anti-aircraft battery, but once she started listing, the guns couldn't depress enough to be effective against the torpedo bombers coming in on the high side of the ship, and they made pretty quick work of her from that point. So it's a good thing the U.S. Navy kept the Avenger. After Midway, the new torpedo bomber really started to show its capabilities. In August of 1942, Avengers sank the Japanese carrier Ryujo. Hey, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation of any of these Japanese names, but Ryujo is R-Y-U-J-O. No promises on pronunciation of Japanese names today. The Ryujo had been causing some real problems all over the Pacific in the early part of the war. She fought at Singapore, the Philippines, and at Dutch Harbor, many other locations. She sunk or damaged a lot of Allied ships, and furthermore, she survived a lot of attacks. However, at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, Avengers from USS Saratoga found and sank her. From that point on, Avengers participated in battles with a lot of success until the end of the war. It's impossible to say how many ships they sank, because normally the U.S. attacked enemy ships with multiple types of aircraft at the same time, or in successive waves. In other words, they sent in dive bombers and torpedo bombers, and sometimes surface ships or submarines got involved. As an example, the Zuikaku was hit by seven torpedoes and nine bombs before she sank. So who's to say if that should count as a ship sunk by torpedo bombing or by dive bombing? The battleship uh, Hai, H-I-E-I, anyway, uh, she was knocked out of action by a combination of naval gunfire from surface ships, dive bombing, and torpedoes from Avengers before she was scuttled. During the battle, she was even attacked by B-17s bombing from altitude. As usual, the B-17s missed. She can be seen in this picture maneuvering to avoid the bombs. You know, I shouldn't sound too much like I'm criticizing the B-17s here, because I'm not. The plane just isn't too well suited for attacking ships at sea. Actually, it's not even the plane that isn't suited for it. It's the type of airplane or type of attack that's not suitable for that mission. And it's true in reverse, too. If we sent a formation of 100 Avengers to bomb Cologne from 20,000 feet uh, in the daytime, I don't think that would have been effective either. Now, on some rare occasions, B-17s did actually hit ships maneuvering at sea, so it wasn't impossible. A B-17 uh, sank the Japanese destroyer Asashio at the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. B-17s also hit the seaplane tender Akitsushima, I think is how it's pronounced, um, and at least one other ship that was at sea. So while it was rare, it did happen, and the B-17 was one of the few uh, four-engine bombers to actually make that happen. But let's get back on track. Because of the nature of the Pacific War, I can't say how many ships the Avengers sank, but they participated in the sinking of 12 aircraft carriers, both of Japan's super battleships, the Yamato and the Musashi, four other battleships, 19 cruisers, 25 destroyers, and 30 submarines. No other torpedo bomber has a war record that is anywhere close to that. Now, when you add all this up, the Avengers' speed, the ability to operate from very small carriers, um, also, the ability to be catapulted off the side, but it wasn't common, but it could do it. Um, we got to factor in the plane's ruggedness. The technology in the airplane, including the electric turret, the radar, the radio altimeter, the autopilot, then add in the plane's war record with both the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy, and I think it's pretty easy to conclude that the Avenger was the best torpedo bomber of World War II, and not by a small margin. So that's all for this episode. Uh, thanks to all my subscribers. I appreciate uh, you guys commenting and reading those comments. I do try to answer them. And special thanks to all the Patreon members. And for you folks, um, I will have all the manuals related to this video up within 24 hours of the videos released. And of course, the Patreon members uh, got early access to this video. 
That's all for today. Have a great day. Thank you for watching and goodbye.